welcome to Peggy Hughes and I'm the Programme Director at the National Centre for Writing based in Norwich. Um, I'm very pleased to be your host for this wonderful panel tonight featuring Cathy Rensenbrink, Catherine Simpson and Victoria Bennett. As you'll know, uh, these three writers write with honesty and intimacy about death and grief. And this panel tonight is going to explore uh, writing about the intimacy of those things um, and the, from the ethics of sharing the stories of the dead to the decision to write about loss, asking why is it important to write up close to these things, especially in these funny times in the year that we've just weathered together. Um, the format tonight is simply a conversation about that very topic through the prism of the work of each writer and I'm going to introduce them more fully in just a little mo. Um, but we would love to hear from you via the Q&A box um, and encourage you to share your comments and questions for the panel which we'll come to in the final quarter but by all means tell us where you're coming from, say hello, uh, feel free to share throughout and we'll come to those as we go along. Um, at this juncture, though, I'd like to just say that you can find out much more about each of the published books. There's some links on the Stay at Home website, and I strongly encourage you to, to do that, to check them out and to buy them and, su and support the festival that way, if you haven't already, because I am able to say that they're all superb and, and that's something you've got to look forward to. Um, I did want to also say it's just it's a very big and complicated topic. We're all very aware of that. So we just urge you to do whatever you need to do to be comfortable um, and hope that you'll, you'll find the links that the moderators will share in the chat box as you go along help helpful. But here we go. I'll introduce everyone and then we can get into it. So Catherine Simpson, do you want to give us a wave, Catherine? I know our names are all up there, but there you are in Hi. Edinburgh. Hello. Uh, Catherine is a memoir writer, a novelist, a poet, a short story writer and a journalist. She runs creative writing courses, she chairs book events and is a regular culture critic on BBC Radio Scotland. Her memoir, which we're, we're really chatting about tonight, When I Had a Little Sister, was published by Fourth Estate in 2019, and it investigates the suicide of her sister Tricia on the Lancashire farm where they were both born and brought up. Her novel, True Story, Sandstone Press, 2015, was inspired by raising her autistic daughter, Nina. And another volume of memoir is forthcoming in 2022 from Sarah Band called One Body, and it's about the experience of living and surviving in a female body. Kathy Rensenbrink coming to us live from Cornwall. Hi, Kathy. Hello. Is the author of The Last Act of Love, a manual for heartbreak, heartache, apologies, and dear reader. Her first novel is called Everyone Is Still Alive, and that's what we're talking about tonight. It's out soon, out in July. Kathy regularly chairs literary events, interviews authors, reviews books, runs creative writing courses, and speaks and writes on life, death, love, and literature. In previous lives, Cathy worked for the bookseller, the reading agency Quick Reads, and spent 10 years at Waterstones. And despite being shortlisted for various prizes, the only thing Cathy has yet won is the Snaith and District Ladies Darts Championship, which was 17. That's no small thing, Cathy. I think that's wonderful. It's a very big thing, I can tell you. <laughs> it's a big deal. Come on. Um, and thirdly, on our lovely panel, we've got Victoria Bennett uh, coming to us from Cumbria. Hi, Victoria. Uh, My internet is um, unstable. So. Oh, oh, hang in, hang in. Hopefully they'll, well, yeah, just give us, a, give us a little nod or something if it looks likely that you'll, you'll need to dip out. Um, Victoria's a poet, a writer and a creative producer. She founded Wild Women Press in 1999 as a space for women to share their stories and create positive change. Her most recent poetry pamphlet, To Start the Year from Its Quiet Centre, was published by Indigo Dreams in 2020. And it's an invitation to witness the intimate moments of dying, telling the story of a relationship between women that is transformed through grief. Her forthcoming memoir, All My Wild Mothers, is a story of motherhood, family and loss and celebrates the beauty that can be found in disturbed ground. And it was long listed for the Nan Shepherd Prize and won a Northern Debut Award in 2020. So that's us all up to speed with who everybody is. Before we get into it, I wanted to put to you all, I'll come to you first, Victoria, just a little bit more about the books that we're going to talk about. I, I've, I've been lucky enough to, to, to read the memoir. But I think we're mostly going to talk about the poetry book. Can you just tell us a little bit more about the context in which that came came about? Well, the poems um, I wrote in the year following my mother's death. She died from terminal mesothelioma, which is caused by asbestos exposure. Um, and a lot of the poems actually started in Crewe's bereavement counselling sessions. Um, they, they had no intention of, of going and being read by anybody else. Uh, but then about four years later, I decided I was going to, to work on them and I was ready to share them. So 
who came from that experience of being my mother's primary caregiver in the last year of her life. Yeah. I wonder about how that what that then is like if they were written without an audience, a readership in mind, how that what that process was like for you and now they have found a, a readership and they are being talked about here tonight, for example. Oh I think the process in writing them for myself in the beginning was it was important because it gave a space for that grief and a way of articulating it. And it was a you know a, the bereavement counsellor said, look, you know choose the way that you feel comfortable to talk about this. And if, if writing is the way that you feel comfortable, then then write it down. Um, and I think that that helped me have a little bit of distance from the grief, um, but also to put those memories in a place so they were safe. Um, it was, a, I couldn't have written them during the time that I was looking after my mother, but, but it gave a safe space for them to go. And, and the, literally the white page gave that safe, safe space for them to be in as well. Um, and I was ready, four years later, I was ready to work on them and I was ready to share them. And I, by that time, I'd spoken a lot more about my mother's experience and about my experience as her caregiver. And, and I decided that maybe they would be something that would be useful for other people as well mm. to share. Yeah. Did, did you find that distance that they came out that side of the editorial process quite changed from what you'd first put down there in in those bereavement sessions some of the poems changed quite a lot um they became shorter <laughs> a lot of them um but one I mean one in particular words for dying to is um it's actually written entirely from things that my mum said in in the last year of, well the last not the last year in the last month of her life so it's it's entirely spoken in her words and that that is written as she said them and it, it came out in the way that it's there so yeah yeah each is different yeah um Catherine can I come to you next for, for a sake could you tell us a little bit just again a little bit more about the the context of when I had a little sister and the, the yeah. where you were at when you were writing it yeah okay yeah so uh, when I had a little sister that's that's me there with my little sister on the front of the book um so my little sister Tricia was 46 when she died um uh, seven and a half years ago and at the time, I was a writer, I'd had a no the novel published, uh, but I hadn't had any long form memoir published. And I didn't actually realise at that time that I would ever write anything like that. And somebody said to me, actually, at the time that Trisha died, oh, you'll write about this one day. And I just said, no, there's no way that I'll ever be able to write about this. I wouldn't know where to start. It was just far too big and catastrophic to even imagine writing about it. And then um, I was due to go to the Hawthorne uh, Fellowship, which is a castle in Scotland. If you're lucky enough to go, you get looked after like a queen and you get you know time to write and it's all rather marvellous. Um, but I hadn't got the feedback on the novel that I was working on at, the point, at that point. So I knew I had to have something else to write while I was there. And when Trisha died, she left a big bag of diaries uh, dating from when she was 14 to when she was 46, written on the day she died. And I'd said to my older sister, I couldn't ever read the diaries. And I, in fact, at that point, when Trisha died, I would probably have put them on, the, on a bonfire because I, would, I just thought that they would, be, they would contain so much pain and so much depression um, and possibly blame for me and for the family that I thought I can never read those diaries. Uh, so my older sister took them away. And then when I was going to Hawthornden and I thought I need something to concentrate on something that you know, I've got the month in which to do it, it suddenly seemed that the time was right to maybe read the diaries and see where that led me. So I spent the first week um, at Hawthorne Castle just reading the diaries. And that was like a form of time travel. So I'm, st I'm starting off with my sister there, 14, and reading. She didn't write every day, but she certainly wrote quite regularly. So I'm starting off with her at age 14, reading right through her life, right up until the day she died. And I realised pretty early on that it wasn't full of blame and, and it wasn't full of blackness because probably because when she was very, very depressed, she probably couldn't write. But there was a lot of happy things in there as well. And it was great to be in a company again because uh, it really was like being in a company again because she kept mentioning... Um, songs that she liked and writing lyrics out. So I'd put the song on and I'd listen to that whilst I was reading that bit of the diary. And it really was like having her there at Hawthorne Castle with me. So I then spent the next three weeks at the castle writing what became the first 30,000 words of this of the draft, which, um, yeah, then eventually became 
when I had a little sister. Something Vic, Vic, Victoria just said about um, sort of the, pinning the memory, as it were, and using that white, was, it, was that something of the, the same sort of endeavour for you then, the kind of taking those songs and those things that you found and, and sharing them more widely, um, yeah, the memories? Definitely. Yeah, I was just thinking when, when Vic said that she wrote it for herself to start with, that is definitely the case with me as well. This book was written for me. Um, and it was really only after it came out that I realised how other people find it really useful as well. And um, because of, obviously there's a lot of stigma and shame around the subject of suicide and depression. Uh, a lot of people don't want to talk about it. And therefore uh, people can be quite scared of mentioning it in case they upset or embarrass people or, or whatever. So I've, I've had so many messages from people saying, I'm so grateful that you wrote this down because it's meant that, you know, you've told my story or you've, you've I've never read this story written down before, but I've lived it. Somebody only wrote to me about two days ago saying that they've been able, they'd read the book and they've been able to breathe without shame for the first time in two years since their sibling had died by suicide. And that is just so sad, but actually so gratifying for me as well that in sharing this story, it is helping other people. And I know that Tricia would, um, she was a really lovely person, a very kind, helpful person who would very much be gratified by that as well. Wonderful. And is that, is that would you say, a side, a side effect, if you like, of, of having written it? Or was that part of your intention when you set out to do it, do you think? No, I think my intention, my intention was um, to try to work out what on earth had happened, because it was... Mm. It was such a shock and it, it's almost like an unbelievable shock. You can't really accept that it has happened. Um, so in going through all the old diaries or the old photographs or my own diaries, my own memories, it, it gave me quite a long time to begin to come to terms with the fact that this thing had happened. And then when I, I took me a year to write the first draft and, and that was a really hard bit because I then had to send it to my agent and it was like, I was sending Trisha away again because I'd spent this whole year with her. If I felt like writing this book. So that was quite hard to finish writing it actually. But then since then, of course, I've then had lots of opportunity to talk about it like I am now. And that's felt brilliant because when somebody dies in any circumstances, maybe more in these circumstances, I don't know, but if, when anybody dies, you don't want to leave them behind. You know, she was only 46 and, and I, you know, I wanted to bring her with me. Um, and I feel like she is, you know, she is coming with me um, still because I'm still talking about her um, and people are still reading about her. Brilliant. Yeah, we're going to there's lots in here that I want to come back to both of you on there. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to bring Kathy in, though. Kathy, can you this is third, fourth book, sorry, but but first novel. Um, tell us uh, where where this one came from. Well, I mean, I suppose, I mean, I've always wanted to write a novel. I think since I knew what novels were, I wanted to write one. And then I did just keep getting. I was trying to write novels and then I would try to write a novel and then the the furthest I ever got was chapter seven and then my dead brother would charge into the pages and take it over and eventually I listened to him and I wrote that book as a memoir so my first book The Last Act of Love is about the death of my brother. Um, then I was going to write a novel but then I learned so much from the response from other people to reading that book, a bit like Catherine describes, other people writing to you, it's so amazing, that I then wrote another book about grief and loss <laughs> called A Manual for Heartache. And then, and then I wrote Dear Reader, which is another memoir, I think maybe because by that time I'd just become really scared of writing a novel, but have finally managed to write a novel. And I really tried incredibly hard to keep death out of it. Um, and I managed more than I could. I mean, as I say to people, like it could have been a lot worse. <laughs> I just, not, I mean, it's just naturally, I don't know. It just, just it, I'm, I'm interested in it. Are there any subjects I almost think? Um, and so, yeah, so I tried to not make, um, I tried, but it's, it's the way I naturally think. I think I'm hypervigilant in my own life that everyone's about to die. And in fiction as well, whenever I start thinking of someone, the, the next thing that happens is they're walking into a road and getting run over. So it's a big effort for me to keep people in the land of the living. And I think to keep myself in the land of the living. Yeah, but goodness, yeah. What, what, do you, what do you think that could happen in the, not, I mean, subject matter aside, if you like, but what kind of fictional treatment bring do you think that couldn't that you couldn't do in, in the non-fiction, if you see what I mean, is, you know, as a vehicle, um, what was different for you in writing it? 
Well, I think it was more that this sudden amazing realization that I didn't have to, and everybody didn't have to die because I'm making it up, I'm in charge. And it was such a, I mean, I know it sounds like ridiculous and obvious and did you not know, but if, but it was such a astonishing thing to realize that I don't have, that I can save these people. I don't have to kill off. Um, there's a central thing that happens in the novel and, uh, and there's another whole draft of the novel that exists where, uh, where someone else dies. Um, so I had a whole first draft of it where someone dies and then I just couldn't bear to, I was just sitting on that draft. So I just couldn't bear to have that happen really. And then I suddenly thought, I don't have to, because this isn't real life. You see, in real life, I couldn't control who lived and who died. But in my novel, I can control who lives and dies. And I'm not having it. I'm not having this person <laughs> die. I feel quite shook because obviously having read it I know I know what I'm guessing I know what that what you, yeah. you might mean and, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about that it, it, it just in terms of alternative universes and it, it made me think of um Joan Didion's absolutely peerless book The Year of Magical Thinking which I'm sure it's people here in, in the room with us have read really beautiful but yeah that kind of that the trick we play to imagine that it could be otherwise um yeah goodness yes, I've always dream. been I've always been obsessed with that personally so my brother was knocked over when I was 17 I've always been completely obsessed with what would have happened you know and we were together in the we were together in the place and I like I asked him if he wanted to live home with me and he didn't come could I go back in time could I make him get in the car with me what would life be like if I'd made him get in the car what would I be like if that hadn't happened so I've always been completely obsessed with that in my own life also completely obsessed with it because of that in literature so books like Life After Life by Kate Atkinson which plays out several different options in time and so then I think fictionally, I wanted to play with that, both about death, but also in small ways. Because again, that is one of the fascinations of fiction that you kind of, you endlessly have these narrative choices to make, which you sort of do in life as well. I mean, I tend to think of life like it's a book. I'm not sure that's a good idea, by the way. <laughs> I just, I, I have a problem with life in a way because it's like, I, I still feel it's some sort of cosmic joke and I'm just in my own choose your own adventure series being read by other people often who are thinking, oh, she, she's chosen the wrong direction there. <laughs> you know. So I wanted to sort of, I wanted to play around with that. So in the big ways in the novel, there are the roads less traveled, but I think also in smaller ways as, as well, I'm always trying to pop up this idea that there's options and then we decide and do we commit and do we commit enough? What would happen if we did something else? Yeah. Gosh, there's loads in here. I want to get. I want to ask a couple of quite general questions of all of you, and then we're going to get up close with a couple of the, the books again. Just and then we'll come back to more general things. So, first of all, we've all we touched on it already, but we all experience bereavement. We all experience grief. Death is around, but but yeah, it's so hard to talk about, and it's still not something that we talk about easily. I think, Victoria, coming to you first. Why do you think that is, and do you think conversations like this and, and books like yours help? Is, is I'm going to put that to the others as well. I think um, as a culture, we're a little bit frightened of death. I think that, um, you know, extend as far as the medical world with my experience with, with my mother, that, that they didn't want to, nobody wanted to actually say that she was dying and that there wasn't any cure for what she had and, and that nobody wanted to tell her when it was happening, even though she kept asking and, and it, People are afraid of, of what happens and what happens with the body, it seems, as well, and um, and uncomfortable in my experience. And I've experienced several people in my family dying in quite a short succession. Um, and we don't have the vocabulary for it, it seems, to talk about death and to sit with death and to sit with people who've experienced grief. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of a an overriding drive to kind of put a band-aid on it or to fix it or to say the right thing, which, which there isn't really any right thing to be said. Um, but I think it is changing. I think you've got things like the Good Grief Festival that started last year and that, you know, that there's, there's things like that where, where it, it seems to be brought more into the mainstream, there's dialogue around death and around grief. Um, and I think there's more, you know, palliative, care doctors, you know, Catherine Mannix, and um, I think who are starting to bring that that vocabulary to us. Um, and I think that that can only be a good thing, really, because there's really only one certainty in life, and that's that we are going to die. I mean, everything living has to die. So 
it seems important that we find the language to talk about that with ourselves and with each other. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's um, something I think about just like sort of language for crisis, I suppose, and when language and, and you know, when is it equal or un unequal, not equal, rather. Do you think poetry as a poet and, you know, is that a space that's somehow easier, do you think, to communicate these harder sort of topics at all? I think the white space around a poem allows allows us sort of silence and a, and a breathing space around the subject. Um, and I think it's been in there, you know, I mean, when when often with funerals, it's people reach for poems to be read at funerals. And so I think there's kind of a, a legacy of that, of that being spoken about. Um, and I think it's it's maybe something that people can kind of read it's something smaller and then it's it's not quite so immersive um and i also think that people can put it away and and be slightly detached from it but also very kind of moved by it so yeah, i don't know <laughs> yeah, yeah thank you um kathy i'm gonna ask you a similar what, what do you what do you think we're getting better at talking about this stuff um, I mean, I think probably the, I mean, the Victorians were good at it. They were sort of death soaked, weren't they? they you, you wore black clothes and people knew that you were the, you were bereaved and probably knew not to ask too much of you. Um, and I think we've really lost the plot on it. And I think all this awful sort of media, sort of sentimental nonsense where you'd think like, you know, we are going to die. I remember saying that in an event, a bit like Vic said, I was doing an event and I said to, you know, in the pre-COVID days, room full of people, and I said, we are all gonna die. And there was this sort of intake of breath. <gasps> and th I mean, this was grown ups. <laughs> I don't mean I said it to 10 year olds, I said, we're all gonna die and everyone, and I said, oh, sorry that I'm the one that tells you that. And it is like, we've sort of slightly lost the sense of the fact that it's gonna happen. I, d I mean, I'm really interested in how different cultures do it as well, which I, there are a couple of good books about it. I don't know much of it. I'm half Irish. And whenever I've been to Irish funerals, it, there's just a lot more sort of crying and wailing, which might be a better thing. Um, and I think that, um, uh, cause I explored this a lot in my first book, because this, this whole idea that, that, that death is the worst thing that can happen to us. Whereas of course death is a natural and organic event that will happen to all of us. Being medically kept alive, however, is often a terrible thing and it happens because we've lost the plot on the fact that death is a natural thing. So um, there's a recent essay by Kate Clanchy, actually, she wrote, she wrote about her parents. And I think, you know, anybody listening who wants to consider more about it, I thought that, I thought it was just such an interesting look at, in our, in our sort of terror of death, our, our, our desire not to accept death and not to accept that death will happen. We often, um, get to a point where we're doing sort of other we're doing awful things to people really because we can't admit that actually now it's probably time for this person to die and that the person themselves often wants that a bit like Vic said her mother something about the medical world I think infantilizes you so they there's because some people might be surprised and shocked to be told that they're going to die I think everybody treats patients like they've you know like you've lost all your brain cells just because you've become a patient so that so it's difficult to get an honest discussion out of people I think um so there's all that going on it's all complex it's all difficult and I think as well it's upsetting so certainly the reason why I, I mean I find it very odd because of course in my now that I keep writing books about it and keep talking about it I'm often talking in these contexts with other people who are interested and it's really helped me to see I don't mind talking about it at all I mean it's my kind of my favorite thing to do I like big talk about big subjects I want to talk about things with meaning um in my in my in my real life when I'm just dropping my son off at school and, and I just want the other parents not to think I'm some kind of fruitcake that's why I don't talk about death. So I'll start crying at the school gates and everyone will say like, oh, we don't want our child to go to her house for a play date. So I think that it's, it's sort of really important to keep connected into what everyday experience is and that you don't want to be a watering can all over everybody all the time. So you're kind of trying not to frighten the horses, I suppose. So I think that's a lot of reasons. And everybody's so frightened of saying the wrong thing, which I also think is a shame because we can't, if we can't express ourselves, you know, if we're so scared of saying anything wrong that we won't say anything at all, that also doesn't seem to be good. So it's just a big kind of thorny problem. It's, yeah, it's complicated, isn't it? Um, yeah, and, and the balance, absolutely take, take the point about, you know, when when's the right, the right moment. Um, 
Catherine, of you then, I, I did want to ask you specifically, you know, because your book, the subtitle is the story of a farming family who never spoke. And, you know, so that's, I just want to ask specifically about that atmosphere for you in, in handling this subject matter. What were the, the very probably atmospheric and specific pressures in, in, in taking on this, you know, um, this material, I suppose? Yeah, well, well, we were probably quite a traditional family it, growing up in the 60s and 70s, a farming family in Lancashire. So, you know, we're not really known for, you know, uh, verbosity at, at the best of times. So, you know, there was very little conversation. It was all talk around about what was happening on the farm and what was happening with the animals and that sort of thing. Questions weren't encouraged. Conversations weren't really encouraged. And difficult subjects were definitely not encouraged. So, so yeah, so that's where I come from. Um, and I think that growing up in that atmosphere actually turned me into um, a very close observer because I was always observing, um, trying to find out things by observing, you know, what were they saying? How were they, how was all the people reacting? What did they really mean? What did people say when they left? You know, so I, it turned me into, the, into this kind of, uh, kind of observer. Um, but having said that, um, would I have dared write this book if my mother had still been alive? I think the answer to that is no, I wouldn't have written it if my mother had been alive um, because I, as it turned out, and I didn't realise this was going to be the case, she ends up being quite a major character in the book. And she she died in 2006. So, um, but, you know, I, I wouldn't have even dared voice the subject of writing a book about this to my mother. I just, I just wouldn't have been a thing that I could ever have done. So I once asked a very well-known writer, actually, um, how do you go about writing about your, who, a, a writer who writes memoir? And I said, how do you go about writing about mothers and sisters and things like that? And she said, I waited until they were dead. And, and I think that's kind of realistic, you know. Uh, so my mother was dead. Trisha, obviously, I was writing about her dying. Um, so there was really my older sister that I had to think about because we I was one of three sisters. And when she gave me the thumbs up... Um, I thought, okay, I can progress with this. And then I told my father, who was very old by then, he was about 89, 90. And he wasn't, he didn't look too sure, but then he started helping me with the research, going through old photographs and old papers. And I thought, right, okay, so that's his thumbs up. So I think if I didn't, have, if I hadn't had the agreement of the people who were directly involved, I probably would have found it very hard. I may have still written it, but I wouldn't have shown it anybody else. Mm. Um, so it was really good to, to get that support from, from the family. And I was really worried about writing it, even with their agreement, because I didn't know how other people were going to react, you know, other people in the family, um, you know, a little bit more distant, because I, I couldn't clear it with everybody and I wasn't going to clear it with everybody, you know. But I mean, my mother was somebody else's sister. You know, my mother was somebody else's aunt. And I'm saying things that maybe they would dispute or, or their truth would be different to my truth. But actually, that never happened. That never happened at all. Um, people were just really, kind of, re really um, sort of respectful of the fact that it was I was telling my story in my way. And uh, I always warn people who are writing memoir, you know, be careful of the memoir police. They'll be, they'll be, they'll be turning up at the door saying that never happened in that way. That didn't happen. Actually, people have been really good about this book. Whether it's because it's quite a sensitive subject, I don't know. But they've all been. Everybody's been really supportive about it and really. Yeah, so I mean, I was terrified though. As the publication date came nearer and nearer, I thought, oh my God, I should never have said anything. You know, we're a family who don't speak. What on earth am I doing? But then once I had written it down and it had come out and people had begun to react to it and I got Kathy's lovely review in the Times, that helped. Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> and, um, and then I, and I started to then feel really empowered by, by the whole experience. Um, and and it, it was like, you know, I was... A, a, 50 odd, I was, I don't know, mid fifties or something when the book came out, just when I'm supposed to disappear and not have any voice at all. And suddenly I'm out there, you know, talking away and people are actually listening to me. And it, it, it was a very, it was a very, very empowering thing in the end to speak, to speak out. Yeah, I bet. Gosh, I am. Yeah, I, I love those observant moments in your book, Catherine, the, the hiding behind under tables, kind of like listening to the adults and being told to stop mithering. That really reminded me a lot of aunts and grandmothers and things. Um, yeah. It was a complete horror, actually. Because, I mean, I did in the end become a journalist, but I, but only, be, you know, I never, ever thought that I could write for a living because, you know, right, nobody wrote, nobody even read in my family. 
So the idea of being a writer, just, you know, Enid Blyton was the writer. She'd taken that job. You know, nobody else could be a writer. So to, to actually become a writer was, was, was uh, it was amazing. But I look back and all the clues were there. You know, I was writing notes on my family. <laughs> you know, I've got notes. I'm interviewing them about all that, you know, from years back. So and saving all little bits of uh, ephemera that have just really come in handy when you're a memoir writer. A bit. Vic, can I ask you the same question, just about the kind of, yeah, the, 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 the personal, I don't know, questioning in writing of, on this material. What, was, it a, was it a challenge for you to overcome, to think of, you know, writing about this or was it always, or it wasn't? Um, well, I mean, writing the poems wasn't a challenge because like I said, that was kind of a private thing that I was doing anyway. Making the decision to share them was um, because, you know, the way that I wrote them was very close up to the actual sort of physical experiences. And I had to kind of sit with that for quite a long time and ask whether or not I had the right to, to share those experiences with other people, um, especially since my mother couldn't say anything. Mm -hmm talking about her, her physical process of dying. So there were, there were some very, very intimate moments in there that, that I talk about. And in the end, I didn't, I didn't show them to the rest of my family. I didn't do uh, what Catherine did and probably because I was too frightened. And I thought that if I did and they said they didn't want me to share them, then I wouldn't share them. And I kind of, I constantly have that struggle between my right to write as a as a writer and tell the stories that are my stories to tell and my desire to not upset anybody so those two are constantly at battle and, and really the only way I can get through them is by ignoring the one that's that's worried about upsetting anybody and just deal with it once I upset them um and I've kind of done that all my life um, but in the end I decided that they were important enough to share because if I couldn't get over that barrier of sharing what those experiences were like as the caregiver, then, then that just contributed to that, that silence around what caregiving with terminal illness and, and end of life is, is actually like. Um, and also there was a the thing of, I wish I'd been able to read them yeah. when I'd been you know, going through it myself. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And then when I did share them and when I did share them with, with, uh, with my family, for the most you know it was a positive response and and my my dad in particular just said you know there your mother would have been proud of you so you know turned out all right in the end great that's that's a that's a, that's a great review i mean what of, what of the memoir was that a different sort of um approach i know that we you know we're kind of we're speaking mostly about the poems but i'm, I'm curious because it goes into much more detail and is obviously much longer form and all of the rest was that a different um consideration or well I still haven't shown them <laughs> Catherine Catherine mentored me in this so um, I have had the advice to make sure I show them <laughs> and uh, and Kathy in fact both Catherine and Kathy have given me this <laughs> advice and I'm completely ignoring them um I won't do eventually um yeah I just have to write what I write and try, I, I've gone back and reread and rewritten and reread. And I believe that what I've written there is written from compassion and love. So, you know, I'm hoping that that's enough to carry it through. Um, but yes, again, the same thing about whose stories am I telling and which stories do I have the right to tell? Because obviously I can, I can tell stories of, of my grief, but there are other people's shared grief as well. And, you know, they're, they're people, you know, I may be writing about, for example, my sister dying when, when my sister drowned. Um, but for other people, that's their mother and, you know, their daughter and it's and their partner. So that's their story. Yeah, yeah, that's it. But I'm not telling their story, I'm trying to tell mine. When it comes to the to the dead, they're always the living. Cathy, I just want to ask ask you also. I know that the, the novel. I'm sorry, it's not as as pertinent to the novel, but it's. I think it's. In, I'd like to hear what you've got to say, just in terms of the last act of love and anything that did kind of come into the novel in this same regard. Just the yeah, the the ethics of of this 
for you? I think it's really difficult. I mean, one of the things I do love now is teaching people. I'm a big thumbs up to Vic for, I think, ignoring the advice because one of the things, <laughs> anybody who's been taught by me, and I've had a look at the participants and hello, students. Um, anybody that's been taught by me knows I go on about just, to, I tell you what I think, but then you make your decision. You have to, you have to decide. You know, I can't decide for you. So my personal thing was in a kind of like really horrible way, well, I mean, I did, I thought about my parents a lot. And, I, and again, a bit like Catherine, I just don't think I could have done it without their goodwill. Uh, as in, I just don't think I would have been able to because it was hard enough anyway. But, but of course, apart from them, I didn't have anyone else to think about. And, I, and unlike Vic, I didn't feel my brother was belong. I felt that the people who, the people that needed consideration when it came to my brother, because I didn't feel he would, like I didn't, I didn't feel he was somewhere disapproving of me for writing about him. So I actually didn't really think, I didn't worry about his privacy being dead. Uh, I did care about my parents, but after that, I didn't care. I felt that the people that deserved consideration about my brother were me and my parents. So I kind of siloed it in for that. I mean, I did actually, I, I did extremely due diligence on that manuscript and anybody I mentioned, I wrote to them, told them what I was saying about them, offered them the option of having their name changed. And apart from two places, I said, I'll take it out if you don't like it. The two places where I didn't offer that was where I didn't want to do it. So I think this is the thing, you've got to be really clear. If you're going to show it to someone and they say, I can't stand that, you can't publish it, what are you going to do then? So don't, so it's right not to, if, if you want to publish it and you're scared they might do that, then like, don't, you know, go nuclear, you know, don't show them. But it's, it's all incredibly, it's all difficult, this stuff. It does need a lot of thought. But the main thing I say to people when I'm teaching is, it's so much a memoir writing. What changed me from someone who started things and didn't finish into someone who's written, frankly now, shed loads of books, I still can't quite believe it, um, was that I worked out what to worry about when. And worrying about what people are gonna think is something you do when you have a whole first draft. Because if, you, if you're worrying about it at the beginning or part way through a project, you just stop yourself. Or, or certainly I didn't have the oomph, I didn't have the ability, you know, it's like, um, you know, my book as well, my memoir didn't start off with the idea that anyone would read it. It was destined for a draw. I was just trying to write it out of myself so I could write funny books about adultery. You know, that was that was all I wanted to do. And then, of course, it ended up as a book. But I couldn't have, I wouldn't have had the stamina to even, ugh, you know, like to put the, sh put the shame on the page. You can't imagine audiences at that stage. You can't. If I'd, if I'd thought about everything that would eventually happen, I just wouldn't have been able to do it. But then you, you've got your draft and you make your draft better and you reconcile with all this stuff and then you're on the radio and then somehow it's just one step at a time, you know. <laughs> and suddenly here we are, yeah. Um, gosh, yeah. I want to stay with you, Cathy. I want to ask a little bit about the novel and about how funny I found it. Not just me, though. Nina, Nina Stibbe oh, and yeah. uh, Philippa Perry and lots of lovely people have, have just commented on how very funny and, um, and and moving and all the all the other things that it is. Humour has always been present in your work, even in in the in the, you, especially as a foil to these darker, you know, mm -hmm. dark dark things. Why is that important to you, and how do you know um, you've got the balance right? And I'm going to ask something similar of you, Catherine, because I think your book equally is 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 very just well, makes makes me laugh and lots of the tales of family and things so Kathy uh yeah I mean I think I've got arguably quite a dark sense of humor I didn't realize when I wrote my first book I then spent a lot of time doing events in Scotland because as you know Peggy uh, the Scottish art scene is very thriving and it was only I learned so much about myself on that book from audiences generally but it was only in Scotland that Scottish audiences told me how kind of Gallic my sense of humour is. And of course it's because it all comes from my dad, my Irish father. And I think sometimes I do, I have to be careful sometimes with English people because I can offend people because I will make, uh, in general, I'm a, a sort of compassionate, fair-minded, not, you know, I'm not a bull in a china shop sort of person, but I can sometimes offend people if I don't know them well, because I will make a joke. I will look to find something funny in a very dire situation, but, for me, you see, and certainly my dad is like this, I'm doing that slightly dangerous thing of thinking that because my Irish dad is like this, this is what all Irish people are like. But I think it, I think it is a, I think it's an un-English quality. English people, when they're laughing, they're enjoying themselves. 
But, you know, I don't make a joke to enjoy myself. I make a joke to stay alive. You know, I make a joke because you, there are moments that are so grim that if you cannot find a chink of light, if you can't find a way to enjoy this moment, you just might as well give up. And certainly when, in my first book, where the humour comes from, it is usually from my dad because he would, he would just find a way, you know, we'd be in some desperate, terrible, awful situation. And he, and I always remember when, cause you know, we went to the court, this is, you know, we're going to court to get permission to, you know, end my brother's life, starve him to death effectively. And we're standing outside the court. And it's the same day, if you're a younger audience, sorry, you won't even know this, Linford Christie was a libel case because tabloids kept talking about Linford's lunchbox. Um, anybody of a certain age will probably remember this. And so we're in the court and it's the same day as that. So there's loads of photographers trying to photograph Linford Christie. And we are standing there and then Linford Christie walks by looking all athletic. And then my dad said, he said, look at him go. He said, if we're going to the same place, he's going to get there first. <laughs> and of course, it was just so it was just so funny. And suddenly we're laughing and suddenly it just does feel like we can we can make the next step. We can literally put one foot in front of the other and we can get through the rest of the day. And I think that's what. That's what humor is for me, it leavens the pill. You know, it's what, it's kind of almost how I stay alive really. It's where, where you look for a joke. And so internally in my very close family, we, we'll, we'll, we'll look, look at each other and say, is it too soon? <laughs> and then, and it's a real gift. Like in my family, it's a complete gift to offer somebody something funny when something dreadful's happening. But outside I, I'm a bit more, careful I find people don't people don't want to necessarily be people don't but it's never within my family it's never ridicule you know it's never it's always laughing with not laughing at and it's always it, it's a gift it's a really generous way of trying to help you get through the next moment but but yeah to be used with caution because if that's not your if that's not the language of your family or your culture I guess it it can feel sort of jarring and wrong yeah very much the same in my my Northern Irish family. So yes, endorsing these <laughs> sentiments. Catherine, can I come to you? And then I'm gonna I'm gonna remind everybody now. Actually, with questions, comments, pop them in the in the chat or the Q and A box because we've we've got about ten minutes left. So I don't want to uh, lose sight of that chance. Um, Catherine, though, but the humour in the book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, again, I, yeah, I agree with, agree with Cathy that there are very few circumstances in which there isn't something absurd. Or ridiculous or ultimately that makes you laugh and I, I often find myself when I'm writing kind of walking the line between laughter and tears and they're often very close together mm -hmm. um, but I do find that um, it's usually what people say in the moment that's funny not the thing that's happening it's the way people react to the thing that's happening that can be very funny and I think I'm probably inspired by um, Alan Bennett who gets Northern women and the way they speak, Northern women of my mother's generation, he gets how they speak absolutely. And it's just so funny if you get the rhythm and that you get the, the words right. And Victoria Wood, who just knew, she could tell a story that was both hilarious and terribly sad at the same time. And she just really got it. And, there's, and again, there's something about the way she just used very few words, but they, they were the right ones. And, you know, you can laugh and almost laugh and cry at the same time. And I suppose Jeanette Winterson as well, again, another Northern writer who the way she writes about her mother and they had a you know terrible relationship, actually, a very sad story. But it's hilarious if you read the, just the way she describes her mother, Mrs. Winterson, who has a lot in common with my mother in a lot of ways. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's, there are very few, uh, very few situations where you can't find something funny in the way that people reacted to it. But, but, but that's in a, not in a disrespectful way, obviously, but I th you know, when I say to people, there's quite a lot of black humor in my book and I can see them looking at me, is it, how can you write a book about your sister dying by suicide and there'd be anything funny in it? But of course, my, well, for a start, my book goes back three generations. It's not just about my sister. It goes back and digs up quite a lot of family history as well. So, and there are endless absurdities um, in a family history, like there are in every family. Um, that are funny. Um, 
Thank you, Catherine. I'm just, I'm, no chat or no questions just yet. I'm going to just keep, we'll, we can just keep on, but we'd love to hear from you if you do have any. So do pop them in. Vic, I'm going to ask you uh, something I read in the paper, uh, an interview with Ali Smith last weekend, I think it was. Um, and I just loved uh, something that she had to say about, um, uh, she said she's always felt that a book's already written, whatever it is that we're writing. And our job as writers is to unearth it without breaking it or doing damage in the digging. Um, I just thought that was such an interesting sort of concept, especially when it comes to material um, this sensitive. And I, and I wondered if you, what, how, how it's been for you to, to do the excavation and to protect both yourself and the material, um, if that makes sense. Um. I think if I, you know, if I say about the memoir, that's probably more mm -hmm. relevant mm -hmm. in that. Um, it's taken forever to write. I'm not, I'm not a fast writer. I quite admire people for writing fast, but it's taken, it's taken nearly a decade to actually write it. Um, and I've had to just sit and allow those memories to come up. And then once the, once the kind of the bare bones of those memories were there, then I was able to kind of, dig back in literally dig back in and since a lot of it is about literally digging up rocks and plants and soil um I, I was kind of doing that metaphorically as well um and lucky enough to have guidance from <laughs> both wonderful women here so uh, you know that helped me do that and helped find that I think that it's just about sitting with it for me mm-hmm mm -hmm. I'm just going to look, we do have a little question. I don't want to miss. Uh, here's a question. I'll put it first of all, I think to you, Catherine. Uh, oh, we've got two questions. Let's go. So is it, is it easy to get writing? Um, how easy is it to get writing with a difficult subject published, Catherine, to your mind? How, how, easy, it to, how easy is it to write it or to get it published? To get it published. Get yeah. It published. Again, it's probably a lot to do with the tone, I think. If you can write about a difficult subject, but make it very accessible and uh, full of compassion and humanity so that people maybe at the end of the day find it uplifting in some way as well. You know, it can be terribly sad and tragic, but it, I think ultimately there's got to be something uplifting in it or it will be too much for people to, to read. Um, I've just written another book uh, called One Body, which it's about living in a female body but it was actually I, I wrote the first draft um, about having breast cancer because I have breast cancer so I was I was being treated and so on and I, so I wrote the first draft when I was going through it so it was kind of written in real time just going back to your Ali Smith um, thing there mm -hmm. I've had her quote on my wall there for months the book already exists and we have to come out to meet it and excavate it and deliver it and that, I've had, I love that quote mm -hmm. so I wrote this book thinking I was writing a book about cancer and then realised once I'd finished it, I wasn't writing a book about cancer at all. I was writing a book about what it is to be female because so many things that came up during the breast cancer treatment took me back, you know, puberty, pregnancy, breastfeeding, all these sorts of things were coming back up and coming back up. So the first draft was about cancer, but that's not what the book's about. Now, you know, some publishers said they didn't want to publish a book about cancer. There's too much cancer. We don't want cancer. But then when it was re um, repackaged as something you know a book about being female and about living in a female body then the publishers will look at it so it is how you package it up as well mm -hmm. so yeah. the tone of packaging yeah yeah that's good good advice um Kathy I'm going to put this one to you this is would you suggest writing creatively even beautifully about death helps us accept its inevitability and should writing perhaps form a part of the grieving process the mourning process sorry any thoughts on that? Certainly, yeah. I mean, it can if it's your bag. Um, I, I, I think it tends to be a, a good idea. I think it probably depends on how you process the world in the first place. Like if you're not the sort of person who thinks in a writerly way, um, then I'm not sure that being bereaved would bring that out of you. Maybe it, maybe it would, you know. And I think that I think the whole thing about writing creatively, writing beautifully, I think it's really important to suspend judgment of the writing and just get the writing done. And I think that's whether or not you're trying to sort of write about something in a slightly therapeutic way or whether or not your, your aim is to get something published. So ultimately you do want your writing to be very good. But I think certainly in terms of getting it down, you just have to lose any sense of judging it and just allow it to allow it to be and allow it to breathe. I'm really enjoying the... Um, you know, Vic saying she's slow and it took 10 years, but books often take, you know, my brother was knocked over when I was 17 and I wrote the book about, I've, the book was published when I was 42. 
you know, we've heard from Catherine that it took a long time. And I often tell my students about Catherine because there's a bit in the book, Catherine, where you say something like, my mother had to die for me to be able to pick up a pen. So, and I think that's the, it's really important to, I think, separate the writing from the publishing just because the publishing muddies everything because it is difficult to get published. It's difficult to get anything published. Um, but it's what I feel really is important is to do it. And it might not be what you expect. You know, I didn't write, I didn't, I never, one of the reasons why I didn't write my book thinking that it would be published was I just never thought anyone would want to read such a distressing and miserable, about such a distressing and miserable thing. And as it turns out, the book isn't distressing and miserable somehow, but I didn't know that I could do that. That couldn't be my intention. And I think that's, intention's a really tricky thing with writing. And I think it's better to kind of not demand it of yourself. The, the only thing I ask for myself in the early stages of a work is to put down some words. Don't ask for anything else. Don't ask for it to be publishable. I don't ask for it to be beautiful. I don't ask for it to be coherent even. I don't ask for it to be exhaustive, definitive. I don't ask for it to be wise. I don't ask for any of those things. I just do it. The rest will come, you know, mm. so. That's great advice. Yeah, um, I'm ever mindful of time. We've got one final question. I think we might have answered it along the way. It's about untangling different strands of grief when we might have experienced different losses within a short space of time. I've written about my first big breakup happening soon after my mum died. I felt guilty that the more immediate distress seemed to be about the breakup, but of course I've realised, you know, that it was all wrapped up. Anyone want to, want to say something about that? Yeah, can I? Think, Sorry, yeah. tell yeah. my street question. Go. Um, the main thing that you have to do is you have to to be honest because um th because this is the thing you're right morally and from a societal point of view we all feel a bit itchy that you might care more about the breakup than the bereavement but that's why you have to go there because other people will feel that as well and other people will feel shame about that so if you can honestly get that into the page then that's that's really where you're cooking with gas when it comes to writing so don't write what you think you should feel or how you think you should feel, or again, back to, you know, how you think you should write something beautiful or how you think you should write something socially significant. Just kind of dig in, in that kind of, you know, um, I like the Ali Smith quote as well, but I tend to go for slightly muddier things. Just kind of like get in the trenches and like squirm around in your own guts. <laughs> Find the shame, you know, shame's important. What makes you blush? What makes your skin crawl? And if you start getting that on the page without worrying about anyone reading it yet, you can make all those decisions about if you're gonna share it later, but start getting that on the page, get the inconsistencies on the page, get the, you know, get the, I can't believe I did that the night before that funeral, you know, get that on the page. And that's, I think that's the stuff, so. Go for it. I've, I've loved myself tonight. It's been so I, nice. I, I, I think... will charge off and write something now, slowly, privately, <laughs> messily. <laughs> That brings us to our perfect finish. Squirm in the guts, I think. I don't know. I don't think we can we can top it. And I think we have to we sadly have to draw to a close there anyway. Um thank you all so much for you know sharing with us and, and to everybody who's been with us and leaving nice comments. Thank you so much. I hope it's been I hope it's been what you hoped. So um I, I think Carly's gonna play us out, does it work? But um yeah, thank you all. Yes, thank you all so much. And thanks everyone for being here. That was absolutely fascinating. So have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye.